Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar on multi-activity events. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a second, but before we get rolling, I do want to go ahead and go over a few pieces of uh, housekeeping. So as always, our microphones are muted. So if you have questions, be sure to send those over to the Zoom chat window. We have Samantha in the webinar today and she'll be monitoring the chat, answering questions throughout. If there are some really good questions that we need to review at the end, we will have a few minutes of Q&A towards the end where we will address those questions and kind of maybe demonstrate a few other things. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so we will have that recording posted on our YouTube channel. And uh, I will mention again, you know, for our YouTube channel, today's webinar is going to be uh, a kind of a dive into multi-activity events, which is going to uh, assume a little bit of event knowledge. So we're going to be glossing over some of the things that are pertinent to single activity events. If you need a more starter approach to events, we have several webinars and training videos on our YouTube channel. Um, feel free to stick around today, even if some of this might be uh, over your head or not. Um, cause you can go ahead and watch this and we'll have a recording if you need to come back and watch it again. So, uh, again, thank you all for coming. We also want to point out that on clubexpress.com, we have the calendar section, which will give you an overview of all of our upcoming webinars. We'll be putting out a schedule for our November and December webinars pretty soon here. We also want to point you to our YouTube channel. So I'll mention this one more time. You know, we have a YouTube channel and we do recommend that you subscribe, not just to kind of <laughs> bump up our subscriber count, but also because that's where we put a lot of our version announcements and training videos. And that way you can stay up to date when we put out new features and things like that and see all of those uh, neat tutorials that we make for those. Lastly, before we get started, I do want to point you to clubexpress.com forward slash reviews. We love to hear from our customers and our reviews are one of the ways that we kind of build a roadmap for what we want to improve on. So, you know, if you see anything that you would like to be improved on, or if you just have comments about the way the system is working for you currently, please leave us reviews um, over at clubexpress.com forward slash reviews. It really helps us uh, get an understanding of how people are using our system and how they uh, are enjoying it. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into today's webinar, again, on multi-activity events. Today, we're going to be covering how to do the basic configuration, how to start a multi-activity event, how to set up registration, how to set up multi-different tiers of pricing. Uh, we're going to walk through the configuration of a few activities and items. Uh, we'll go over, you know, how to set up different locations if your activities are taking place in, uh, you know, separate locations from each other. We'll also go over the changes that occur with registration and fees and who can register, because those are very different from our single activity events when you're doing a multi-activity event. Uh, we'll also review the way to ask questions for each activity. So like in a single activity event, when you ask questions, it's just you know one set of questions for either each individual or each group of registrants. With an activity question, you can actually narrow that down and say everyone that registers for this activity or purchases this item will get asked this question. But if you don't register for that activity or item, you aren't posed that question. Um, and then we're gonna go over a few kind of other tools like the multi-activity reporting. And we'll go over uh, how to copy activities and items so that it saves you time instead of having to type everything in over and over. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and switch over to our demonstration. I'm going to change my screen here in just a second, and we're going to take a look at how to uh, begin a multi-activity event, and we'll talk about the differences when we're doing that configuration. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go ahead and switch my screen over. So you should now see the Northwest Balloon Club. This is one of our demo sites that we use for a lot of our webinars and our sales demos. Um, you'll notice I'm already logged in as Martin Smith, who is our favorite administrator which means I have the control panel option here up in the upper right hand corner. And to go and start looking at events, I'm going to simply go into the control panel, go over to this website tab of the control panel and under website modules, we'll have this events option right here. So I'm going to go ahead and go into our events page and we will land on this events manager. I've already searched for two events that I made for us to look at today. Um, I made these ahead of time through the, the magic of television. We have the, uh, the balloon conference and the balloonist dinner. You'll notice that right now, if we look over on the right-hand side of this search area, we have a single activity event, the balloonist dinner, and we have a multi-activity event, the balloon conference. So we're going to be looking at the balloon conference, and in a little bit, we'll actually talk about how to switch from a single activity event to a multi-activity event. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click on this pencil. Anywhere you see the pencil in Club Express, that always means edit or make changes. And we're going to step through the configurations that we set up for this event. 
So when we land on this page, this should be familiar to a lot of you. This is our just uh, kind of uh, event editing page. So when we land here, we've got all of these panels on the left-hand side, basic info, for and a description, all the way down to our policy section. And you'll see some of these tabs have been pre-configured and some of them haven't. If I go ahead and click on basic info, we'll see the kind of summary of our basic information. And we have this little pencil where we can edit basic info. The basic info page is the first page you'll land on when you start creating an event. And when you click on this tab, you'll notice there's something missing. So a lot of you who have started an event before, the very first thing you get presented with in the basic info tab is that, is this a single or multi-activity event? If you start out with a multi-activity event and you create multiple activities, you will no longer be able to go back to a single activity because if we were to try to change backwards, the system wouldn't actually know what to do with the uh, additional activities beyond the first. So we'll actually be playing around with changing this back and forth um, with our other event here once I get through uh, describing the other differences. So that's the first bit of difference we see on this page is that we are no longer able to switch back to a single activity event once we have really gotten through the process of creating a multi-activity event. Uh, another change of uh, the way this system works when we're dealing with uh, a multi-activity event, if we go down here to our registration fees page, we go ahead and click on this pencil again to look at some differences. You'll notice there's a few items missing from this page that normally show up when you're configuring a single activity event. Um, we are missing our track registrants or track attendees. That is because with a multi-activity event, you are not able to um, track attendees for the whole event. Instead, you are tracking attendees per activity. So each activity you can set to track attendees, then you can track attendance to uh, each individual activity. You'll also notice we are missing our capacity up here above waitlist. There is no capacity for the event as a whole. Instead, just like with the tracking attendance, the capacity is limited by activity. So you can say, you know, one activity is able to uh, facilitate maybe 10 attendees and one activity maybe can facilitate 100. Um, you can have different sizes for each activity. And the purpose for that is you may have, you know, an entire event capacity of maybe 100 or 1000. But maybe if you're having some sort of panelist or some sort of, you know, biking event or some sort of, you know, smaller subset of that event, maybe you can only fit, you know, 20 or 25 in the room that's taking place. Or maybe there's only a few slots for a ski club if you're having, you know, a race or something like that and only 20 people can sign up. Um, the capacity can change depending on what type of activity you're dealing with. So instead of showing up on this page, it's going to show up on the activities page. And we'll be going through that configuration in a second. You will see the wait list on this page, which is related to our capacity. And you have the option to go ahead and enable a wait list here. And just like with a single activity event, you'll have your maximum count and your wait list hours, which are how many people can be on a wait list for an event and how long they have to register for the event once they uh, receive the notice that there is availability. You will notice that with our single activity events, you have the option to automatically process a wait list. With multi-activity events, that isn't possible because we are running one wait list for multiple activities, so it has to be managed manually. Um, we will talk about when we get to the activities page, you can actually have multiple activities contribute to whether or not the wait list becomes active. A note about that, once the wait list is active, it is active for the entire event. So if we turn on a capacity limit and the wait list, for one small activity, if that activity fills up, let's say you know we have a panel and only 20 people can attend, the entire event will no longer allow people to register because that event is full and it will start sending people to the waitlist even if other activities have room uh, for people to sign up. So that's something you have to be very careful with when you're configuring this event is you may only want to turn on the waitlist for you know say a primary activity that everyone has to sign up for uh, you may not want to turn the waitlist on for your smaller subset activities. And we'll go over that configuration uh, when we get down here in just a second. One more difference from single activity events is when we get to the who can register page. If we take a look at this, it'll look very similar, but there is one core function missing from this page now that we're doing a multi-activity and that's pricing. So we can still set up who is actually able to register for this event as a whole. And when we set up those registration types, we can use the same things we use for single activity events, you know, active members, 
uh, any non-member, member guests, and so on and so forth. What we will be missing is setting a price because in setting, instead of setting one price for this event as a whole on this page, each activity can have its own price. Further down, we have this questions page, and you'll notice when we look at the summary, we have three different tiers of questions instead of two on a single activity. We still have our registration questions and our registrant questions, and we can still ask those where if someone signs up for this event at all, you know, each group would get asked this question once and each individual would be asked this question once, but you can also set up activity registrant questions where each individual that is signing up for an activity will get asked that question. You'll notice though, if I click on this pencil, I don't have the activity questions on this screen. All of that is still controlled from our activities and items page. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get to that page where all of the kind of meat and potatoes of configuring a multi-activity event takes place. So once you've, in your basic info, once you've selected a multi-activity event and moved on to this other these other configuration items, this activities and items uh, tab over here is going to be enabled when we click on it. So we'll come over here and again, we'll click on the pencil to take a look at the editing for this page. And one of the reasons we're hosting this webinar today, we, you'll, a lot of you may have noticed we have other training videos and webinars about um, multi-activity events. But the reason we're kind of rehashing this is because the design has changed significantly. It used to be a, you know, similar to this registration and fees or the who can register page. The activities used to show up in a table like this, but now they show up in these little boxes, which gives you a much easier way of viewing each activity and getting a summary of that activity, as well as more detailed buttons for how you control that activity. So there's two different types of uh, items or activities we can create on this page when we're configuring this larger event as a whole. We have activities, which we can create by clicking this new activity button, and we have items, which we click by, which we get by clicking this new item button. The difference between the two is that an activity is kind of an existential thing of just, you know, I'm going to attend this sort of function. That would be, you know, maybe you're attending a lunch or you're attending some sort of panel. You know, I made this activity down here, a Q&A with Peter Balloonman. That is an activity because it's something that I will attend. And then there are items which you can do things like t-shirts or hats or even, you know, meals, like a lunch voucher that I built into this uh, activity or this item right here. Um, once we click on either of these, it's going to begin the process of configuring that item. And then once we finish setting up the name and description for it, it will create a new panel here, which will then give us the options to further configure it. So let's go ahead and walk through the configuration of a new activity, and then we'll walk through the configuration of a new item so we can see the difference between the two and kind of quantify that. So I'm going to go ahead and click on new activity up here. And you'll see the first thing it's going to ask me is just a few very simple questions about, um, you know, what is the name of this event? And so I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, balloonist panel. And so maybe this is a, you know, a panel for us to have our, our balloonists discuss maybe best practices when you are uh, you know, ballooning. You can enter a description here. That is optional. You don't have to enter a description. Um, and then you can also choose who this is visible to. The default is visible to all registrants, and that's almost certainly what you'll want to leave it as. You do have the option to make an admin coordinators only uh, activity, but that is usually saved for uh, if you're trying to remove an activity from being available or even being visible to people that are registering. So maybe if this panel fills up and we feel bad about people seeing that it's full, maybe we can turn it off and switch it to administrators, coordinators only, and then that way no one is seeing that they're missing out on that. That's just one of the you know options here. But again, you'll almost certainly want to leave it visible for all registrants. And then we have this date and time, and you'll notice we have date and time set up in our basic info for our event. But because this is an activity within that event, we can actually choose a different date and time, though it still does have to be within the window of the event. So if our event is defaulting to starting on November 4th, so that's Friday, November 4th, we can't set this earlier than the actual event starts. So anything within the window of the event is fair game. So I can say this actually takes place on Saturday because our event is running for three days. So this is taking place on Saturday the 5th. And I can change my start time to 10 a.m. And maybe that's only running for an hour. So let's say it runs from 10 to 11 a.m. And that is a smaller window of time in just a sliver of the event as a whole. And once I save this, 
Now I'm going to have an extra option. So here's that balloonist panel that I made. There's the day it takes place on and the time. We're also going to get a snapshot of who has registered for this. So right now you'll see I've already registered two people for the balloon conference primary activity. And we'll talk about that, what a primary activity is. It's just got a way of configuring it. We have one person registered for our lunch voucher and two people registered for our, our uh, Q&A with Peter. But because we just created our balloonist panel, right now we see a snapshot of uh, no one has registered for this yet. And then here's our type visible and you'll see selected no, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, so you get these several options over here when we create an activity. You get edit, location, registration and fees. And you'll notice these are very similar to the functions we have over here on the left hand side, because each activity is essentially a small miniature event within the event itself. So if we click edit again, it's going to take us back to that configuration page we were looking at. And so there we can come back and change our uh, title of this activity if we need to. We can then come back here and set it to not visible to uh, everyone again if we need to, or we can change the time. So if, you know, if for some reason this panel needs to get pushed back, we could shove it to, you know, maybe noon to one if we wanted to. And then we could save that or cancel those changes. Next up is we have location. So we already have location for the event as a whole, but if you are having a, a, a large, say, conference of some sort, you can actually have more specific locations and you'll see you'll present it with this screen where the default is the location of this activity is the same location as the event. But maybe if you have a panel across the street or at a different restaurant or you're having a luncheon of some sort, you can choose to say that this activity actually is in a different location and fill in the location for you know a different uh, section of the event. And then you can also put in different video conferencing links. And so the, the registrants of this activity would get a notice where they would have the address for the event as a whole, but they would also get a notification letting them know that the activity they registered for is taking place in a different location. And it would also provide them with a video conferencing link for that specific activity as well. The next configuration item we have over here are registration and fees and who can register. And so these are familiar to a lot of you who have created events before, and those are also showing up here on this tab. If we click on registration and fees, this is a small miniature version of our normal registration and fees page. The first thing we're gonna get is our capacity, or uh, sorry, if we show this uh, activity on the registration screen. So the default is gonna be yes here. And just like with the visibility, you almost certainly wanna leave this as yes. So that's just another option for you to make this invisible to people that are registering. So if you set this to no, this effectively turns off and people will not be able to register for our balloonist panel now. If we leave that as the default yes, then we get all of these other configuration options. This is a really useful tool. This next one down is, is this activity automatically added to registration? This is somewhere where I'm going to talk about um, kind of primary activities. So you have the option for all of your activities to be optional. Now, someone, if they're registering for the event, has to sign up for at least one activity in order for them to complete their registration of the event. But something I like to do is every time I create a multi-activity event, I have something that I call, and this is just, you know, personal terminology, but I call it a primary activity. And that is an activity that I will refer to as the event as a whole. So by default, there isn't a, you know, kind of activity that is going to track overall attendance or track overall capacity unless you create it. And that's why we have this option here. So we can say, is this activity automatically added to a registration? We have the default, which is no, it's optional. So people can choose whether or not they want to attend this activity. You have this option, yes, but they can remove it, where this option will be pre-checked for them, kind of suggesting that they check it, but they can uncheck it. And then finally, we have, yes, it is required, which meaning anyone that uh, which means anyone that registers for this event is going to sign up for this panel or whatever activity we are currently working on. And that is a nice way to kind of ensure that everyone that signs up is signing up for, you know, our primary, our primary activity. And so I'm actually going to go back out and show you an example of that. This balloon conference ticket right here, anyone registering for this event, I'm going to say you need to sign up for a ticket. And so on this registration and fee section for this activity, I have this set to yes, and you cannot remove it. And that way, everyone registering has to sign up for a ticket 
and I always have a count of how many people total are attending my event instead of just head counts for each individual activity. This is also where we can set our capacity for this activity. So we can say this is the capacity limited. If this, uh, if the attendance to the entire event has a head count, so maybe we can only, you know, fit a thousand people at our conference, or uh, maybe we can put that limit here. And because you are required to sign up for this, only 1,000 people maximum would be able to register for this event at all. I'm going to go ahead and leave that at 100 for now. Um, if we say no, then any number of people can sign up for this event. But if we say yes, then we get that capacity option. And then just like with any single activity event, we have the option to show that capacity. We can show how many slots are available. And then we have a new thing. And this is only a, a setting in multi-activity events, which is waitlist inclusion. And we get yes or no here. If we choose yes, then if this activity fills up, registration for this entire event will shut off, meaning that you are not able to sign up for this activity and it'll start or for this event and it will start sending people to the waitlist instead. Now you can actually have multiple activities contribute to the waitlist. But as I said before, if any activity, even if we have three different activities using the waitlist, if any of those three becomes full and is at capacity and has waitlist set to yes, then the event will no longer accept registrations and it will um, start sending people to the waitlist. So my personal recommendation when I'm working on these is I say, you know, you have one primary activity, you have it set to yes and it's required, and then you set waitlist inclusion to yes for just the primary activity. That way, if our entire event fills up, if we get 100 people to sign up, then it will send people to waitlist. But if our smaller activities fill up, people can still register. They just will be prevented from registering for those activities. And then we have some other familiar uh, registration and fees settings, which are, are we collecting fees for this activity? And we can say yes or no. And then we also have this late fee option where maybe if someone's signing up too late, we can say yes on a certain date. Maybe if they're signing up tomorrow, um, starting tomorrow, they would be start paying the late fee instead of the normal fee. But for now, I'm just going to leave that as no. And then we have our tax rate option, which is also available in single activity events and what financial account this activity is uh, applying to. A note about financial accounts and tax rates here, we can actually charge tax on certain activities and not charge tax on other ones. So if you have, are selling merchandise, or if you, you know, are required to charge tax for certain activities, but not others, you can actually break up whether uh, what tax rate is being applied to certain activities. Um, same goes for financial account. We can actually have for reporting purposes, we can say, if you're signing up for the balloon conference ticket, that goes into our master event registration. But if you're signing up for a panel, maybe it goes into, you know, education fund because they're, you know, going to an educational panel and we want to track those funds slightly differently. And then here we talked about how the attendance was missing from the registration fees page for the event as a whole. This is where we can track attendance for the activity. And so I would turn this on and I'm tracking the entire conference attendance, but maybe I don't need to track attendance for, you know, one of our panels. If we are tracking attendance, the activity itself will have its own attendance tracking and you can uh, check people off on different activities. So that's a way to say, you know, uh, I'm going to track activities for or track attendance for this entire event using this. And I can also track attendance to maybe just our balloonist panel or maybe our Q&A with Peter. So that's our registration of fees. The next page we're going to look at is who can register. I'm going to use the one, the uh, empty one over here on Balloonist panel. And by default, this is going to look very similar to our other single activity event who can register. But the biggest difference is when we're choosing our registration types, instead of active member or non-members, when we click this, we're actually going to get our names that we set up on the entire events who can register. And so this is where we'll say we predefined this list. And so if we go back a page and go to who can register for our event, there's that list of items I made. And so we can see there's our two different guest types of options. So we can say a non-member is allowed to bring a guest and a member is allowed to bring a non-member guest. And then we have our members and our non-members who are able to attend. But when we're editing this page, 
we get all of these different options to create registration types. But when we're looking at who can register for our activities, and we go to who can register, we're going to use that predefined list that we set up on the who can register for the entire event. And this is where we set prices. So maybe we can say for members, it's free to attend our balloonist panel. But for non-members, maybe it costs $5. And for both of our guests, it also costs $5. And so now we have, you know, free admittance for members to this panel. And then we're collecting fees for uh, member or non all of our non-member options. We're collecting $5 for attending this panel. Now, this is not the price for the event as a whole. This is a price for just the activity. And this is a neat, the kind of really neat thing about multi-event activities or multi-activity events is that we can kind of piecemeal the price of our event. So it's not going to be the same price for everyone. If I sign up and I don't really want to go to the balloons panel, I'm not going to be charged that $5. If I'm bringing my own lunch and I don't sign up for a lunch voucher, then I don't need to worry about paying that price. And different people might end up paying different prices for the event, depending on what they choose. And we're going to go through the actual registration process once I get done going through our uh, activity configuration. So our next little option here is questions. And this is going to function just like the questions on a single activity event, except for I'm defining the questions that are going to be asked only for this activity. So if you don't sign up for the balloonist panel, any questions I assign here won't be posed to you because they don't apply to you. So we'll go ahead and add a question here and we'll say anyone attending the balloonist panel, we need to ask you, you know, what languages do you speak? And we'll say we need to know what languages people speak attending this panel to make sure that we have, you know, maybe translators for this panel. And so now only people signing up for the balloons panel will get asked that question. Then after that, that's all the these first five here are the only ones we need to configure in order for this to function. The rest of these are reporting so we can click on registrations to see who has signed up. So if we go to our you know, conference ticket and we click on registrations, we'll see we have two names here. We can see whether or not they're a member, are they the primary person that signed up and have they paid yet? And also on what date did they register? So we'll see there's our two registrants already. And then we also have the option to copy. And so if we're having uh, a large event that has many, many activities, maybe we don't want to have to click through each of these every single time to finish configuring. If we're having, say, multiple panels, we can actually just copy this and say, we're going to have Luna's panel day three. And that saves me all of that configuration I just did. And so now I have our normal balloonist panel and our day three balloonist panel. And I could maybe change this to be, you know, balloonist panel day one or day two, and I can copy this and all of the configuration I just did here will copy over, but any registrants that have signed up for this one don't get copied over. And this is a very easy way for us to kind of expand the list of activities available to us without having to do all of the grunt work every single time. Additionally, we have the reports option where we can run and export reports about who is coming. So we've got our activity registrants, which is, which is just a report letting us know who signed up. And then we also have registrants with answers, which is going to give us that same report letting us know who's coming, as well as any answers to questions that we have attached to that activity. So if we want to print out and let our panelists for day three know what languages people speak when they arrive, we can go down here, click on this report and print this report out and we can get it in a number of formats, you know, PDF, CSV, those of you who have been using Club Express for a while are familiar with this screen on how to get reports in different uh, formats. And then finally, we also have our delete option where we can say, I no longer, you know, need this activity or the balloon, the day three balloons panel got, you know, canceled. So we're not gonna be doing that and we can delete and we're not having that uh, day three balloons panel anymore. We're just having the one panel. The biggest difference between activities and items is that items are uh, products that people can purchase, you know, be it a be it a voucher for lunch or a hat or a T-shirt. And so being a product, there's no location. It's just something you get when you attend this event. And so location is disabled. But we do have the option to still add registration fees and we can still say whether or not it's required. But we can also allow for quantities. 
And so if people are allowed to purchase multiple and a good way to, to do that, if we're having a three day conference here. So there's going to be three different uh, chances for you to eat lunch and you can buy these lunch tickets or these lunch vouchers um, in, you know, any number between one and three. Now there is an option to default to one, meaning you can only sign up for one of those. But if you are having a, a you know a three day event and people are allowed to buy multiple meals, you could say the default is one, the minimum is one. You always have to have a minimum of one. Some people will say, but what if I don't want to purchase it? And I'll show you what that looks like. You can essentially just uncheck it, and that will count as zero. And then there's only going to be three days, so there's only three lunches, and so I can say my maximum is three. You can purchase up to three meal tickets and just go ahead and get your uh, capacity there. So then capacity is also kind of, uh, we could use the interchangeably the word inventory. This is how many of this item do you have available? For lunch, you know, maybe you're able to feed everyone in the conference, so there's not really a capacity. But if you're having, you know, hats for sale, maybe you only have 50 hats and you can come in here and say, you know, once we sell out of hats, there's no more. And again, even though this isn't item, you can still wait list this and say, once we sell out of hats, you know, we're not going to let anyone register, but again, that's something we wouldn't want to do uh, for this specific scenario because we don't want to stop registration for the whole event if we are uh, still allowing people to sign up and not get you know, lunch or a hat or something of that sort. So we can leave capacity set to no in the case of lunch vouchers. And so that's an item. The rest of these are all set up the same. You can ask questions for items as well. So if you're buying a t-shirt, you can, you know, what color t-shirt do you want, red or blue, what size t-shirt, you know, small, medium, large. You can ask all sorts of questions and all sorts of, you know, who can register, who can sign up for prices. And you can set different registrations and different prices for each activity. So now that we have this all set up, let's actually go through what it looks like once we've finished configuring all of our items and activities. So let's go and return to the previous page. And we're going to go up here and click back to event. And so this is our event landing page. You'll see we have all of the details. Normally, you would just have one drop down here letting you know the details of the event. But because we have multiple activities, we have the details for this event laid out. And we can click these little carrot drop downs to see how much does it cost for the conference ticket. How many slots are available? Here's the price for just a ticket. Here's the pricing for a lunch voucher. Here's a, the pricing for our balloons panel. We can see that it's free for members. And so on with our, you know, Q&A is free for everyone. So there's our details. And if we wanted to register for this event, we can come over here and say register now, just like any normal event. And the rest of this is going to look just the same as a single activity event with one kind of big change where if I go through here and I'll say I'll sign myself up and bring a guest. There's my registration and my guest registration. This page is also the same as a single activity event. I'll fill in my test person's name. This is my test guest. And this is the page that's going to differentiate a single activity event from a multiple activity event. So we're going to get this page where we can say, I, Martin Smith, am signing up for, you know, there's my balloon conference ticket. You'll notice this checkbox is grayed out. I am unable to deselect it because I am required to sign up for that in order to sign up for this event. And then I have my lunch voucher and I can say, how many lunch vouchers do I want? I can get you know, one, two, or three. And I'll say, you know, on the third day, I'll bring my own lunch, but I do want two lunch tickets for this event. And you'll notice as I change the total of an item that I'm purchasing, my registrant total here is going to change depending on how many of these items I'm purchasing. There's my balloonist panel. And you'll see for a member, these are both free. Then I can go to my next page and now I'm selecting activities for my guests. So here's my test guest activities and I can do the same thing. And I can say, you know, we're gonna bring lunch on our second day. Me and my guests are both gonna bring lunch, but here's that balloonist panel. And for non-members, because I'm bringing a non-member guest, it's $5 and I'm gonna say, I'll go ahead and pay the $5 for my guest. And we're also gonna attend all of these activities. And you'll notice because I'm attending one of those uh, activities that has uh, the language question for the balloonist panel, what languages does Martin speak? And I'll say, Martin, he's pre-selected French because that's something he's already entered, entered in his member profile. Um, but he also, let's say he also speaks, you know, Japanese. And then we'll say our guest speaks, you know, Spanish and German. 
And now these answers are going to get re uh, recorded and will be on any reports that we run for the balloonist panel. And then on this final page, we're going to get information about what events and activities that these two people have signed up for. Both of them have signed up for every single activity. And there's our pricing for the items. And then there's our total. The primary registrant is going to be on the hook for the total fee. And just like with a normal activity, we can then complete registration, go to our payment page where we will see a summary of all of our charges. And we can, you know, then say receive check or if it's, you know, paying by credit card, you'd into that for now. I'm just going to say I'm going to record this payment by check because I'm logged in as an administrator. I can do that. And now we've got extra registrants and we'll see there's two registrations. So I've signed up twice and each of them is bringing one guest. So we have a total of four registrants. And so that's the kind of basic configuration for a multi-activity event that's going to have, you know, multiple options that people can choose from. I do want to take a moment and go back to our events page and let's go to our admin screen and let's talk about converting and re and, and kind of unconverting a single activity event. So when we click on the pencil for a single activity event and we click into our basic info, this is a very simple event that has been configured. And you'll notice before I change anything, if I go to my registration and fees or my who can register, we already have pricing for this event set up. And so you'll notice when we have a multi-activity event, the pricing here isn't available, but we do have the option to change this. So if we go back to our basic info, there's that option that's normally available to us, single or multiple. And I can switch this to a multiple activity event. And what I what it's gonna do when I save this, it's gonna take the details that are going to normally be stripped out and apply those details to a single activity within our multiple activity event. So if I save here, now I have this activities and items page. If I look at my who can register page, you'll see that my pricing is gone. And what it's done is it's actually applied that pricing to one activity that has been pre-configured for us using the configuration that we set up as the for the event as a whole. So then if we go look at here in our registration fees, I'm sorry, I keep doing that, or who can register, I mix those two up all the time. You'll see there's all of the things that we set up before, and there's our pricing for this activity. And now we are free to go ahead and add more activities and more items to this event. And our balloonist dinner activity is now considered our, you know, what I would call a primary activity is already pre-set up for us. So you can start with a single activity. And in fact, once you are done, editing, if you only have one activity in a multi-activity event, we can actually still go back here and we can change this back to a single activity event and we can save and it'll do everything that it just did in reverse. The one barrier to that though, is the moment we have an extra item or an extra activity. Now that there are two items here, the system wouldn't know which one is primary and it wouldn't know what to do with the extra bit of information here. So if we go back to our basic info, you'll notice that toggle is now gone. So once we have multiple activities, we can't go back to a single activity. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're editing a single activity event. All right, um, I'm gonna go over a few notes about uh, multi-activity events and then we'll get to a Q and A here in just a minute. Um, when we're talking, when we're looking at reporting on a multi-activity event, mostly it's the same. So right here, we're looking at the balloon conference. We can see our attendance for the event as a whole, and that's going to be using our primary uh, attendance tracking. We also have um, a few extra reports for multi-activity reports. So whenever you're running a multi-activity event, you have these things like activity registrants by activity, and that's gonna give you a report of every single activity and who has registered for that activity, as well as, um, I think we have an activity, oh, it's gonna be under exports. So that's, that's our primary activity report. You'll notice that our exports, which are gonna give you CSV kind of Excel files that you can then manipulate to your needs, we have extra options here as well for our multi-activity events where we have activity registrant data, and that's going to give us all of our information about our activity registrants, including their answers to questions and what activities they have signed up for. 
the rest of the event is going to function just like a single activity event. So the things that we kind of went over today are going to be their, your primary differences. Um, cancellation still works the same. All of the configurations that are available here, like formatted description and your emailing tools and your policy are all going to be exactly the same as a single activity event. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind that, you know, if you are struggling with creating an, an initial event, I always recommend you start with a single activity event and kind of get familiar with that. And then once you've got the single activity built up correctly, then you can go back to your basic info and reconfigure it into a multi-activity event to then create and add your further activities. Sam, how are we doing on questions? So we got a good amount of questions. A um, couple of things that came up that I'll just reiterate. So uh, if we can have activities that are multi-day activities, as opposed to an activity that's just one day. So if you have something that occurs on every day, as opposed to just a specific date and time. And I suggested that if they wanted to do something that covers multiple days, maybe he's choosing an item instead of an activity. Yes, that would be one option. Otherwise, you could just say, you know, in the description of that activity, you know, this runs from, you know, 11.4 to 11.5. And then when they're registering for it, that'll show up as the description for that activity. Um, or you can just run it as an item. Um, there's no kind of, there's no problem with running an activity as an item, especially if you configure that activity um, to be just limit one per registrant. The rest of it will function just like a normal uh, activity. The only difference would be that it doesn't have a location uh, and it would technically have like item tied to it, but most people aren't going to notice that. And so you could just say, you know, balloonist panel as an item and they can check it off just as normal. And can you show how you might find the answers to questions that you would ask for registrations for activities? Yeah. So if you're running, if you're wanting reports for the answers to a specific activity. So let's go over here to our balloonist panel that we just signed up for that had that language question. If we go down here to reports, oh, you know what? I just realized I'm on our demo test club, so I'm not going to be able to run this report. Um, but that's where you would go to get those answers is you would go to the activity, go to reports and do registrants with answers. And that's going to give you everyone that signed up for that activity and all of their answers to questions. I believe this export uh, will give you that same data as well. So this uh, activity registrant data is going to give you each activity that they signed up and their answers to those questions. And that's a bulk data export for the entire event. And what would be the options, uh, or let's talk about, if you could, the process of a member maybe canceling their registration and what it might look like to get uh, what they paid refunded to them or credited to them. Absolutely. So that process is actually going to remain exactly the same to a single activity event. So if we go down here to policy, this is where we can determine whether or not a registration can be canceled by the member. Um, a note about this, a lot of people think that if they leave this set to no, then there's no way to cancel. That's not necessarily true. Even if we set this to no, an administrator or an event contact can still come in here and go to this registrations button and cancel people, even if this is set to no. All it does if we set this to yes is we will then allow members to come back to this event and cancel themselves. So once someone is signed up, where it says register now, it would instead say cancel registration um, once they are registered. And I believe actually because I am registered for that, if we change that setting, it should show that. Um, we can also say we can set a cutoff time saying you can't cancel, you know, the day before. So maybe, you know, at 6 p.m the day before the event. So on the third, we're going to cut off and you can't cancel anymore. And you can also set a cancellation fee, meaning the refund they get would be less this amount. So we could say, you know, cancellation fee of $5, you know, because of the administrative overhead, we're going to keep $5 of your registration, even if you cancel. If you leave this blank, then they'll get a full refund if they cancel their, their registration. So we'll go ahead and save that. And we'll go back to event. And now you'll see there's this button 
cancel registration, which any member who has registered will see this button to cancel their registration for the event on this page. They can actually also see that button in their event history page. They can go and cancel an event from there if they are allowed to. The other sort of cancellation would be going to registrations as an administrator on the back end. And you can search for your registrants and there's our, you know, Martin registered and you can see that he registered two people, the number of registrants. You'll see the total price that they paid. And this little red button right here will let you cancel them. You can also use this pencil icon to modify, you know, maybe what activities they signed up for or how many items they purchased. This will let you come in here, just like with a normal single activity event, you can come in and change, you know, quantity of items or sign someone up for an activity or remove someone from an activity. That's where you can go and make those changes. If we cancel them, it's going to issue a credit to their account for the amount that they paid for it. Um, unless there's a cancellation fee, they would get you know less that amount. But you know, for now, let's go ahead and pretend that we're going to credit, so we're going to cancel someone who's paid fifty dollars. And we have the option to send them an email notification, letting them know that we have canceled them. If they cancel themselves, then obviously they're aware of that. And if you don't need to worry about that, they should still get an email notification, letting them know it's been canceled. But we as administrators have the option to choose not to notify them that it's been canceled. We can tell them in person or just not tell them at all if it was done in error. But for now, I'll just go ahead and send it. And you'll see credits due were created for this account. And now, Martin Smith, the account I'm logged into, will have a $50 credit because it has been canceled. And that credit can be applied to future events. It can be applied to their membership. It can be applied in the storefront. They can use that credit for whatever they want. If you want to refund that, the way that would work is if we go to the people manager, look up Smith, we can go to Martin Smith's account. And if we go and look at payment credit history in their member profile, down here, we can see there's that events cancellation and there's that $50. You can then either send them a check or give them cash or you know Venmo them or however you want to send them that money. You can click on this pencil and say, you know, we refunded that money to them and it's going to oh, refund. Oh, I found some sort of error. This is one of our test sites. So sometimes it has a little, acts a little goofy. Um, but you can see now that I refunded it, the balance is set to zero. Even though they received this credit, it is marked as completed because we told the system to refund it. And that is assuming that we refunded them outside of Club Express. Um, for most customers, I, I don't know if most is the right word, but for several customers, that is the only way to refund them is outside of the system. For those of you who have the Club Express payment processor, there is an option to credit back to a credit card if someone made a payment via credit card. Um, again, that is only if you're using the Club Express payment processor. And the way that would work is you can go to your control panel and in the money tab, you have this option called open credits. And it's not going to work on this demo site because I, I don't have the uh, Club Express payment processor. But from this page, you have the option to um, find any credits that have been paid by credit card. And there will be an extra option here where you can add funds to a credit account and then refund them that way. And you can actually do that, you know, uh, over and over and over. So if you have, you know, canceled a thousand dollars worth of event registrations, you can fill up a refund account for a thousand dollars and then once that clears there will be a uh, an option here to refund people if you want more details about how that works we actually have a webinar specifically about um kind of open credits and how that refund process works so we have more information and detail on that you can also click on this little question mark up here in the right hand corner and that will take you to our help system. And this is going to detail that process as well. So there's a lot of documentation on how to uh, refund someone with an open credit. Uh, again, they have to, if you're going to credit it back to their credit card, they have to have paid by credit card and you have to have the Club Express payment processor. So both of those things have to be true in order to credit it back to them. And kind of speaking about money, but a little bit to the opposite, uh, how would you handle an item that is free for registrants of activities, but has a cost for guests, um, as opposed to maybe members, uh, 
there's a second part to that question that I'm not quite sure um, if it's relevant, but uh, you know, the item that would be free to registrants has a cost for guests who don't participate in any of the main activities. So I think a lot of that would have to do with uh, who can register for those individual items or activities. Right. Um, we don't have a way of saying like, if you sign up for the Q and a with Peter, then your lunch voucher is free. What we do have under this, who can register section, you have all of these options where you can say, you know, for our active members, they get free lunch and we can edit this and we can change that price right up here to zero and we'll hit update. And so what I just did is I changed the um, price for our members to zero, but now our non-members and all of our guest types, which are also non-members, are going to pay $5 for their lunch voucher, but lunch is provided free to members. We don't currently have a way to say, if you sign up for a balloonist panel, then this item becomes free. Um, you have to set a price based on their registrant type. And so you have to control it that way. Um, but you can say, you know, members get one price and non-members get another price. And again, the availability of your uh, registrant types is set up before the activities page here in the actual main event who can register. And so you can actually even say, you know, members can get lunch, but non-members have to bring their own. So if we were to go to who can register and entirely remove these and save this now, because the only option for who can register is an active member, this would be only available to members. So maybe if we set this up as like, you know, a free hat for members that attend our event, then that would be the only option for them to register. Uh, Non-members would not be able to sign up for this at all. And speaking of sign up, I like how you're kind of creating the segues for me. Um, can you <laughs> show what it might look like to sign up for this kind of an event? Yeah, we did walk through that, but I'll go I'll go through it one more time really quickly. So if we go back to our event page, this is what the page is going to look like for. Oh, I'm sorry. It's yeah. um, to register as a guest. Sorry. Oh, to register as a guest. Yes. Um, yeah, I can actually let's just go ahead and log out. We'll go to our calendar. There's our balloon conference on the calendar. So I'm right now, I'm not even logged in. I'm logged out as a non-member on the site and I just clicked on calendar. And so this is our little grid calendar and you'll see there's our balloon conference, the event that we made on our calendar. And when I click on it, these are the details I'm going to see. It looks very similar to what we were just looking at. And if I click register now, I'm looking at it as a non-member. So it's going to ask me, am I a member? Because I would want to get the member pricing. And so it'll say log in to register if I'm a member, but otherwise I can keep continuing. And I'll just say, I'm going to register. And because the system knows I'm not a member, my only registration option is going to be non-member here. And I'll just say test person as my first and last name. And then here's that page. You'll notice because I saved those settings, I can no longer buy a lunch voucher because I set those prices to, or I removed the option for uh, non-members and guests to buy lunch vouchers. So now the only things available to me are the conference ticket, which is again required. And I can click on it to see more details about who's available. I can see there's 98 seats available. I can sign up for the balloonist panel, which will add $5 to my total. And I can sign up like that. I'm gonna go to this uh, Q and A with Peter. And then once I select the activities, maybe I don't want to go to the Q&A or let, actually let's say I don't want to pay for a balloonist panel. You know, I'm not very interested in that. So I'm going to get a cheaper ticket and only pay $15. And then there's my final page where it's going to give me a summary. And it's going to take me to the payment page when I complete my registration. Uh, because I'm a non-member, I and this is one of our demo sites, I don't have credit cards set up, so it's not going to let me enter payment, but this is the payment screen you'll see. And if you have credit card payment enabled, then this payment method here will default to credit card and I would fill in my credit card information and I would be done. Um, but because I am uh, on a test site that doesn't have credit card payment enabled, I can't fill that in, but otherwise I would hit submit payment and that would be that. And I would get an email letting me know that I have paid for my event registration. So that's what it looks like for you know, our non-members. It's very similar to our member process, just, you know, with limited uh, options uh, based on how we configure this event. 
So they clarified the question and it turns out they were asking about a member registering a guest, but the process would be basically just combine the two ways that we registered together. (laughs) Yeah, I actually, so when I, when I initially signed up the, the first time I demoed, I did actually have a guest. So you can go back in the, in the recording, you can go back and watch me go through that again. So now I'm logged in again. It's essentially the same thing. If I hit register, when I am bringing a guest, this is where you define whether or not you're bringing guests. So normally the default is me. I'm signing myself up or you can say me and however many guests I want to bring. And so if I'm bringing two guests, you'll see there's my registration is as a member. My two guests are coming as guests. And then I'm going to fill in my guest information and the rest of the process will look exactly the same, except for the biggest difference is going to be that I'm going to answer those uh, activity questions three times because I'm going to answer it once for me. And then I will answer the activity questions for my guest and then my second guest. Okay. So I think that some of the comments have got died down. We have one more. So uh, Kevin says that we use the guest feature as a registrant that doesn't participate in any activities other than meals, like a spouse. Is that the correct assumption? It seems that you're treating non-members as guests. You can do it either way. There, there isn't a wrong way. Um, both capabilities uh, or both would be good uses for that guest feature. Yeah, guests are definitely, if you set prices for guests or for non-members in the configuration of your activities and items, then those non-members would actually be you know, viable to sign up for other activities. It all just matters about how you configure who can sign up, this who can register option for each of your activities. You can allow guests or non-members to sign up or not sign up for whichever activities you want. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Um, Thank you everyone for joining. We're going to have this, uh, we're going to take a day or two to edit this video and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel soon. Um, Again, a lot of the stuff we talked about today was, you know, higher level event configuration. Uh, If anything went over your head, I would say definitely start with the uh, single activity event configuration and then move on to multi-activity event configuration. A lot of things will make a little bit more sense if you do it in that order. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for coming today. And if you have questions, you know, our support team is always available and the recording of this webinar will be up again. So you can go back and, uh, slow me down. Sometimes I can move a little quickly. So, uh, thank you so much for coming and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time.